Yeah, I would also like to thank Ing Marie and Andy for the invitation uh, to participate in this session. So my presentation is going to be a little bit uh, less exotic, <laughs> maybe not so exciting, but it's uh, it's based on some recent research on uh, some Iberian stellae and. Uh, the idea is to show, like, res in response to 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 the session uh, proposal, um, to yeah, to contribute to this question: what what would um, uh, a focus on art making uh, bring um, to our uh, dealings or research on prehistoric art? So uh, prehistoric art has been traditionally uh, studied as iconography devoid of materiality. Uh, there has been a lot of description uh, been made and uh, usually images have been uh, conceptualized as finished products. So there are many, many works, uh, classic works that we are all using um, for prehistoric art research that, um, yeah, present images, rock art, portable art, statue manures, as finished products or as uh, artworks that were made just in one, um, in one inter intervention. The problem with that is that, uh, well, and the production, like the result of this kind of research is uh, <coughs> many categories, many types, uh, many genres, uh, which are necessary in a way uh, to to initially approach uh, like large data sets uh, because we need to yeah first of all have a previous idea of uh, what we have in front of us as i will show you with uh, late bronze age stellae that's uh, the way we have approached them initially but the problem with that is that then we are ignoring uh, key aspects, especially for us as archaeologists, to understand them in historical terms. Well, in historical terms, in social terms, in ontological terms, independently of the uh, theoretical perspective or the approach uh, you want to deploy. So uh, in this kind of traditional um, approaches or research, materials have not been considered, have not, ha have not been analyzed, um, manufacture techniques have also usually been ignored and also the temporality of, for example, the stone in the case of rock art, um, also in the case of statues or the temporality of materials, how things have changed or uh, the transformations that they have experienced in the case of portable art, for example. Many artworks have very long, well, within the biographical paradigm, very long lives and uh, they have changed throughout uh, these very long-term lives. So I want to exemplify this with the research on Iberian Late Bronze Age stellae. Probably most of you have heard about them. There has been a lot of research about them and also some uh, recent publications, recent books. There are around 150. Uh, they are uh, distributed mainly in southwest Iberia. And as you can see here, these are potentially mobile stones. Um, they have, um, yeah, they are usually large enough to be, you know, to, to, uh, I mean, you can move them, but you will need the help of maybe another person or, yeah, a group of people. <coughs> can move them, but um, they are usually large enough so that you cannot move them uh, on your own. These, uh, these stones are richly decorated, usually on one of their sides, but of course also the stones themselves have been dressed. And this is something that has not been um, looked at uh, very frequently or at all. Here you can see uh, a range of images. Uh, they are usually represented um, following certain conventions. So there are a set of images that are, yeah, recurrently, like, yeah, repeated. We have uh, human figures, uh, very schematic. We have shields, we have swords, we have spears, we have mirrors. These are artifacts that are circulating throughout the Iberian Peninsula during the late Bronze Age. And we, we know the material correlates for them. 
So one of the most recent books that were uh, published uh, in English by Richard Harrison was mainly a catalog of these kind of uh, artworks or yeah, stone, uh, decorated stones. And um, interestingly, uh, even though he paid attention to the temporality of stelae, so he looked at um, possible uh, later interventions, later modifications of the carvings of the compositions, he, uh, his research was mainly based on secondary <coughs> literature, so he didn't engage directly with, stelae, with the stelae themselves. So he visited the museums, but he didn't really conduct new recordings, he didn't analyze them in detail. So as a result, uh, in his book, he he provides uh, a new kind of classification of motives, of compositions. And here you can see, for example, this is one of, uh, uh, well, one of the main contributions of his book is that, you know, uh, he, um, he proposes that there is an evolution from basic compositions to more elaborate compositions. So we have the basic pattern composed of shield, spear and sword, and then we have them with other motifs like anthropomorphic figures and other elements that are circulating throughout Spain uh, during the late Bronze Age. The problem with this is that, well, first of all, you will see that uh, the stelae themselves, the stones, are not represented. So these are two-dimensional images and they are in a way out of context. And, uh, you know, even if we are archaeologists and we are so much concerned about context, uh, about material culture, these kind of images are rather common in uh, art, prehistoric art studies. Another problem with this is that uh, most of these stelae have not been analyzed, uh, like uh, reanalyzed in detail. And the problem is that uh, many of these images could have been added later. Some of them could have been modified, recarved. So we're building here categories, classes, types on, um, on things that we're just um, well, we're just seeing them as, as, as this, but they may not correspond um, to what there is. So probably uh, these decorated stones um, are richer. They are not so, um, well, uh, as simplified as we represent them. So here we can see that, for example, uh, classifications can be tricky because uh, in some occasions we see that um, these kind of iconographies were carved on um, stones that have been previously dressed, as in this case we have a statue manier. So there have been some problems in classifying this. Is this a statue? Is this a stelae? So these kind of problems uh, come from this kind of very um, uh, yeah, very strict classifications that are not really um, flexible enough to account for mm, the kind of complexity that this, uh, these artworks um, materialize and um, yes, and all the relationships that they uh, may suggest. So these uh, decorated stones may be uh, carved on older Dressed, dressed stones, they may be recarved, they may be fragmented, they may be reused. So they may have been engaged in many different ways um, with many different actors. And um, throughout this process, uh, they have been participants in the creation of many different relationships that are being missed because of the kind of uh, studies that we're developing on them. So what uh, I propose is that, as many others have proposed already, is that uh, as a complement to this kind of top-down perspectives, which are of course useful as a preliminary engagement with you know, large data sets, it would be very useful to uh, develop bottom-up bottom -up approaches. That is, uh, looking at uh, every single case, but not applying this kind of generalizing frameworks, but trying to engage with them materially, 
looking at the specific interaction between people, materials, and places. So between the artworks, their materiality, the people that carved them, the people that have engaged with them more, rec more, more recently. Sorry. So the recent research that uh, we have um, developed on late Bronze Age stellae has had two main components. One of them has been looking at the carving techniques uh, and also well, looking in detail, um, uh, analyzing in detail their surfaces to look at not only the carving techniques, but also the process, uh, the, um, the carving or recarving or later engagements or later modifications that uh, these, um, these stellites uh, have uh, experienced and also um, conducting a replication experiment to, uh, to just look at how, um, how could be, like how carving a, something similar like a late Bronze Sage stele could have been with, uh, with a type of stone that we knew and uh, with uh, students from Southampton that had uh, no experience in uh, rock carving whatsoever. So it was, more to see um, the amount of skill that was needed and also the time that uh, you need to deploy to make one of these kind of um, stones. Sorry. So um, there are various cases, mainly located in southern Iberia. Some of them had already been studied and Different, uh, different recordings of them ha had been produced. Uh, in some cases, they were conflicting, you know, interpretations of the same stone with the same engravings. Um, here we have another one, and you see the kind of images that were being produced in general, devoid of volume, and um, they were just two-dimensional uh, <coughs> line drawings. And of course, in the descriptions that were offered, um, no attention was paid or no account was given about the techniques deployed in their manufacture or in the, uh, yeah, in the possible um, long-term biographies of these stones. So we also uh, deployed uh, RTI uh, to look at the texture of the surfaces of stones not only to look at uh, the marks uh, made by the different carving techniques, but also to see if there were uh, sequences between lines, for example, some lines uh, cutting other previous lines or also later interventions. And one of the amazing things is that uh, from these four cases, which were like following the traditional uh, typologies, they were, uh, they, they were classified after, you know, like they were more or less reproducing the same type of iconography. They were classified as the same type of stellae. They were reproducing the, the same type of conventions. But then with this kind of detailed analysis, uh, we could see many, different, uh, ma many differences arising. For example, not only in the techniques deployed in, um, in carving human images, but also in the style, like the outline of the individual images. For example, comparing the different human images or the different shields or, for example, the preparation of the stone surface. And here there are some cases, for example, uh, the two central stellae. One of them, um, the images were produced just with pecking. In the other, on the other case, uh, it was uh, made with pecking and also braiding. So the, the process of elaboration was uh, different in every case. And here we have the replication experiment. So the, the experiment was uh, conducted in the same farm with where this stella was found. And we selected for that the same type of a stone. So we knew more or less uh, the type, well, we knew because we did uh, petrography, we knew that it was a mica schist and we already had a uh, late Bronze Age stella. So we, um, we just collected stones from the area to, to see if the available material was, was enough to work the, the stone, but also, of course, we had flint, which is not local. 
and we um, conducted well the students mainly um, the process. Look, they started to manufacture Stella by working on the surface, by drawing on it with stones, just with the with the tools that were given. And the result wasn't that bad at all. I mean, it, it in a way it was. Um, the representations produced uh, were better that than some of the stellae that are known in southwest Iberia, which look yeah, which look pretty pretty basic. So the ones that you have been before are quite elaborate, but there are some that seem to have been made in a in a rush in a way. So they are not very very carefully made, and that's a very important aspect to take into account because we just because all these late Bronze Age stella are considered as part of one category. We don't make that kind of differentiations and that's important because some of them would have required much more skill, much more time to be produced and some others not. And I think that's a qualitative difference that uh, needs to be taken into account. And the same here, for example, with this experiment, we could see that even though we were working with the same type of stone, both of them were mica schist. Uh, because of the structure of the stone itself was different, the product was different, and also the process of making was different. So the students uh, found more difficulty in working one of the stones than the other. Okay. So what's the conclusion of all this, of applying RTI and uh, conducting a replication experiment? So the idea was to see uh, if a bottom-up approach, if a focus on making, uh, could contribute something to the study of rock art, but in particular, this, in particular the study of late Bronze Age uh, Iberian stellae. Because we have been offered many different uh, classifications, typologies, and these typologies uh, have had an enormous impact in the way we interpret this kind of remains. Because types have been interpreted in terms of ethnic identities or in terms of ideologies uh, or in relation to interaction of the populations of the western um, area of Iberia with Atlantic or the Mediterranean. So the result of this, um, of this kind of bottom-up approach, even though it's a very small um, number of cases, was clear. On the one hand, uh, it revealed uh, the importance of difference. So even though we were working with the same type of Stella, even though they were found very close by, because two of them, for example, were found just two kilometers away from each other, and they were reproducing exactly the same categories of objects. So the result of that is that difference matters. So there are differences in the outline of individual motifs. There are differences in the techniques deployed to manufacture them. Maybe that's related to the specific type of stone, but also maybe that's also related to the specific skill of different engravers. And also, I didn't comment on that before, but there was one stella in which there were also images, other images that didn't seem to be part of the composition that were in the lower part of one stella. And they seemed to be um, yeah, upside down, so indicating that maybe that stone itself had had a previous um, yeah, a previous life, I don't like to use, use that word, but um, yeah, had had uh, a previous trajectory before being carved with this uh, composition. And uh, yeah, so it's all these elements that bring complexity to this kind of data sets. No? And uh, I think, uh, yeah, top down and bottom up perspectives needs to, need to be complementary to account for the complex relationships in which uh, these kind of materials uh, were involved and are still involved. So, okay.